everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Small Business Storytellers. Uh, on today's episode, I have somebody who has some of the same books behind him that I have behind me, which is exciting. Um, but also, we're going to dive into the difference between narrative and story and why is that important for your business? Why is it important to know the difference between the two? And we're just going to talk about how can we incorporate narrative more into the businesses that we're running to have this conversation. I'm really excited to have Guillaume Viat, who is a strategic narrative consultant um, at his company, MetaHelm. And uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Guillaume, welcome to the show. And Seth, thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking forward to diving into this. Obviously, this, you know, the the topic of storytelling and narrative, this kind of starts to get into our our wheelhouse of just things that we're curious and things that yeah. you know our business is built around. So it's always fun to have these conversations where we can go a little bit deeper um into kind of some of these more nerdy aspects of storytelling and narrative and different things. So mm -hmm. you talk about the difference between story and narrative, and a lot of people don't believe them to be different. They kind of use those as synonymous terms. What is the difference between a story and a narrative? Well, before I dive into right into the answer, I just want to give a little bit of context because I think that it's a question of the the answer is it's a question of context. And Seth, um, I, I was for many years somebody like most people who were using the two words interchangeably in everything I was writing and and, and talking about and just because I am curious and I like to uh, go deep on uh, as deep as possible on, my, on what I what I do, I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> if there are two words, that must be for a reason, right? Also, I, I you might hear an accent because I'm I'm uh, I'm French. Uh, English is my second language. I I really uh, became more fluent in English around 35 years old, and so I developed the habit of looking for the definition of every single word to make sure that I was using the words in a proper way, in a proper context and tone in my in this foreign language that is English for me. And so one evening I was running into this question for myself out of the blue, like, oh, by the way, if there are two terms, like, what is that? And um, I discovered there is a subtle difference, which is that a story is a recount of event, the narrative is is also could be can be understood as a as a recount of events, you know, uh, an account of events. And you know, there is typically we think of stories as having a series of steps or phases, or we, you talk about a story arc. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I I've been naturally more drawn to the significant the, the definition of narrative as a point of view. Uh, we talk about narratives for religious institutions, governmental. Um, you know, political parties, societal uh, changes very often. Oh, the narrative around this or the narrative around that. And so <clears throat> that's the facet of that word that I've been really curious about. And so for me, stories are the, you know, the kind of the individual unique pieces of systems that create a narrative. For me, a narrative is a system of stories. A narrative uh, tends to be open-ended there is a middle there's a beginning sorry a middle but not necessarily an end because when you think about a narrative in society uh it's future focused we don't necessarily know where it's where it's headed how it's gonna uh, how it's going to end up and often narratives are exciting because we want to change narratives we want to change the way we talk about you know many aspects of our society if you think about those those this definition now that if we can agree on on that you know uh, as a hypothesis for this conversation that there is that difference uh and i'm I'm not making it up you can also look in the dictionary you'll see uh that there is alternate alt, alternate definition of the word narrative that you know i just i just quoted there but if we can agree that this is uh, this is that difference here and now we turn to business which is you know what we are about to talk about today why does this why is, why does this become important why does this become interesting is <clears throat> because you know if if you have a business you have a chance to do something differently it you can do the same as everyone say you have a pizza shop you can do pizzas just exactly the same as everyone you can buy the same truck the same oven the same everything you know uh, out of the out of the box but you can think of pizza as something that brings something 
different uh, that has a different impact for society and maybe you want to change the narrative around pizza uh this is just one example but i have so many examples around me as i work with innovators these are typically uh, business entrepreneurs who are trying to change something they're trying to 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 modify the course of the way we do something whether it's food or transportation or information technology i mean you name it education health um, right the sky the sky's the limit so for me when i hear a narrative i hear what's the discourse what's the theme what's the opinion what's the main way we do something when i hear a story maybe it's an an example it's a specific situation a specific person who experienced something that may go against this narrative or actually support uh, support this narrative you know we, we we tend to believe more into uh one ideology versus another because we've heard stories that support that ideology right. yeah that's really interesting you said something or you kind of alluded to something where we can't we can't change a story but we can change a narrative Exactly. And I think that's really, really interesting to to look at. And even in context of businesses and the customer stories and different things, you know, we, we can't change the stories of the experiences people have had with our brands, but then there is this narrative that's kind of this ongoing story that's in the process of being built. And that's really what we can change. Where do you see this uh, concept of, you know, being a strategic narrative consultant? Like how does that integrate into a business? What do you, what ways when you work with a client do you do you help them using this tool of narrative the function of a narrative is number one to give you a sense of direction and then to spread that same sense of direction to the people you're going to be collaborating with whether it's somebody in your team if you have a team or an outside partner if you work with people who support you in any fashion and obviously um, your customers, your, however you want to name them, your customers, your your, your clients, um, all of these people, to me, I call them stakeholders. So if you have a strategic narrative, you start to show to your stakeholders that there is a direction you you want to go, and maybe they also want to go. And that's that's a critical point here. There's no narrative if the narrative is just about what you want to do and no one cares about this right if no one is excited about your narrative then you don't really have a narrative you probably have an idea something that still needs to be uh, you know vetted since something that needs to be tested or something that you know people don't know yet about and so that's why i focus on and mostly in my in my job i, I help companies align people because especially with companies of a certain size it's getting harder and harder as the company scales to see where the ship is going in fact there is research showing that in companies of about a thousand people only 10 percent of the, the the team the overall you know staff knows exactly where the company is headed hmm. yeah so yeah. when you come in are you kind of helping to somewhat expose that and then kind of help them to identify okay where is the company going and align you know messaging and different things with that like what does it actually look like if a company says okay we we have a narrative problem like maybe i as a business owner don't know where we're going yeah. or maybe i do but nobody else could tell you um what are what does it actually look like for you to kind of come in right. and really improve that well, they, they I mean, when people talk to me, they they know they have a problem. They don't know exactly what it means, where it comes from. So my the first thing is to help me diagnose really what the what's what's the situation. And the number one thing that I look at if is if the flip has happened, like if they understand narrative the same way as I do. And and for this, I give you know lots of information. I educate them. I I share my point of view. Um, or if they really think of a narrative as a as this kind of a shallow thing, this kind of packaging that you want to put around your organization just to make it look good. And so that's the situation. That's the case where I don't go. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I do deep work. Yeah. Um, you know, the metaphor I would use is, you know, I'm not a 
uh, I'm not a, a, a makeup artist. I'm more of a plastic surgeon. Mm. So I go deeper, I do reconstructive, I reconstruct organizations, I reconstruct products. And my number one, my number one stakeholder in that case is the leadership of the organization. Because typically that's, uh, that's, that's who has the, who handles the, the helm, right? right? It's like my company name indicates, I come in and I bring the meta helm uh, to elevate kind of their, their view and their conscious. So I will uh, primarily work with, with the business leaders. Um, and you might, you, you know, fr from my experience, you might have read, you know, I have worked with large organizations and uh, people who run teams of thousands of people, but I also work with very uh, much more modest companies, because like I said, in the, in the, I think we, we were talking about this before we, we hit record here. Um, I care about the kind of leader that I work with. The work consists of uh, looking at the you know everything that makes people excited to be in the organization and diagnose it dissect it and then reconstruct it in terms of a system i see a narrative as a system of four areas that are split into two main dimensions very simple in fact it's the narrative is external and that's that's the number one thing that these days people will think about in terms of what is a narrative it's that yeah it's the marketing thing mm -hmm. right it's the, it's what marketing department does it's advertising it's pr it's everything we say it's it's our message that we share with our customers so that's the that's the number one thing that people think about that's the ex external facet of it but the internal facet is is just equally important is sometimes even, even more like, how do we operate as a team? What's our culture? What do we tell ourselves when there is, there is a situation, there is a problem? Do we, do we hide things or are we more about truth? What are our values there? Mm -hmm. How does the promise that we, we, we tell outside actually works inside? So there are really those two facets in a, in a narrative. So I look at those two things. And I help uh, my entrepreneurs that I work with uh, connect the, connect those dots. Love it. They are evident dots sometimes. Sometimes they are very tricky because when you are in a business, you work really hard to build it, to run it. You forget about that. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine that buy-in from leadership is critical in this. Like it probably doesn't doesn't work if a mid-level manager hires you to come in, but the people above him, or but you know, there's got to be. I could see it kind of working to where if people below, uh, you know, lower in the management tier, they can maybe be on a different path. But if somebody above you is on a different mindset, I would imagine it would be really, really challenging to do this work. Well, uh, uh, it's interesting you, you, you use the word below. You're, you're referring to a specific narrative, which yeah. is the narrative of a company as a pyramid, yeah. right? narratives are unconscious we don't pay attention to them and that's what just happened right now in this recording right we assume that a company is a pyramid which is seth which is absolutely true and right most companies are designed as a pyramid but not all of com not all companies are designed as a, as a pyramid some companies are designed as systems of clusters of of, or like small villages, small tribes, even large companies, large, large, very successful large organizations work as more as holocracy versus uh, you know, typical hierarchy. So this is another thing that I pay attention to. And I have been brought in by people who are, you know, frontline employees or, or managers because there is an opportunity in this kind of, op of, of, um, of organization for people, you know, at the, at the frontline level to also turn to the CEO and say, Hey, we have a narrative problem. We need to do this. And the CEO will sometimes listen. Yeah. But you're right. Traditionally, if there is no leadership buying, it's it's really really impossible. In fact, I just turned down uh, work with a <laughs> very prestigious company that is all over the news uh, lately because uh, we couldn't get buying on this, and I knew that this was going to be a fail. So I didn't want to waste any, anybody's right. time and money there and say, you know, if 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 we don't have that, you won't change anything. Right. I imagine there's also situations where the leader is the leader knows the narrative or they, at least they, they think they know the narrative that they want yep. for the company, but things derail that narrative over time. 
if you could identify some of the most common things that derail a narrative that the leader has in their mind or that throw the narrative out the window or mess it up in a company, what are some of those things that commonly are screwing up the narrative that leaders want for their company? It's not necessarily a, a bad thing that the narrative gets derailed. First of all, sometimes it's good. It means that uh, the context, uh, the environment is changing. And so you need to listen to that and you know make your make your own opinion or whether whether this is a challenge a good challenge or what what's going to be constructive about this challenge but in uh, in many in many times um i'm trying to quickly think about what's what are some of the symptoms of that uh we don't have enough time to uh check on the narrative again if we think of a narrative of a written piece of communication developed by marketing, PR, and that's posted on the website, we can see it. It's there. It's static. And we don't need to go uh, over this very often. But if we think of a narrative as, the, as, as something much more dynamic, much more um, intrinsic to how people operate, that's when you want to spend the time to check on it often. And so in, uh, in many organizations, because the speed is so, is so, you know, we operate so quickly, we don't slow down enough. We don't check on each other. We don't uh, reframe things. We don't ask for clarifications. And so we misinterpret uh, decisions. We will misinterpret choices for, say, product design or how we go to market, or how do we treat um, our customers? What's the experience is going to look like? And it's really the role again of you know if if you've got good leadership in your organization, it's really the role of the leaders to do that. So it will be essential for uh, for 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 the leadership to also spend the time to do some some checking, but also consistently reaffirm what the narrative is about. Repetition is essential. Clarity of thoughts and of idea, you know, of, of ideas is really essential. And you do this through constant communication. I think in the more uh, recent generation, there, there is a higher appetite and, and a higher level of comfort for communicating at a, at a faster pace, being on social media, answering questions, transparency, and so on. But for maybe uh, my generation, you know, I, I started my career in the in the mid nineties, uh, it, it can feel very hard, very, very uncomfortable. We're not used to that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, myself, I've, I, I've, I, I had to go through significant transformation, um, that now I teach my, um, some of my, some of my clients. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really interesting point that it's not necessarily a bad thing if the narrative is changing and, um, mm -hmm. I know I've ran into that in my journey at times where uh, I, we had this first iteration of my business and, you know, when uh -huh. we started the business, this is what it was going to be, but things yeah. change. Um, I, I know things now that I didn't know then. Uh, and so for a long time, I had this emotional attachment. I was really afraid to niche down and focus on mm -hmm. what I felt in my gut. We should be focusing on because I felt mm -hmm. like, no, we have to be true to what we started as. We have to be true to this narrative of right, what we right. were originally going to create. And it was really challenging for me to kind of embrace what things have become and realize that that's not a bad thing. Um, right. What are some, what are some maybe pieces of advice you'd have for entrepreneurs or leaders that are listening that they're kind of stuck in that tension where they realize the narrative and, you know, the, the story they're a part of the story that's unfolding is maybe different than what they thought it would be a couple of years back. And they're having a hard time kind of embracing that change. Well, I think it's, uh, that, that is, there are two, there are two layers here. There's a, there's a practical set of, uh, guidelines I, I can, I can provide is, uh, being able to open the conversation on this topic, just like you, what you did. Right. So carving out a little bit of time with your colleagues to open up to that that observation and documenting it and digging through maybe some of the archives that you have. 
and looking at look oh it's interesting like even pulling some some photos sometimes you know after four or five years you, you and looking at artifacts so doing a little bit of company archaeology mm -hmm. <laughs> is good and recognizing where you come from and and looking at the evolution of your organization uh, so looking at the past is, is good and then the next i mean you 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 very logically, I would also look at the future. So one of the things I do is um, I write myself a letter and I, I have some of the people I work with do that too. I write myself a letter, a one-year letter. Say, you know, it's now, uh, so say we're, we're in 2020, that would be the end of 2022, for instance. Let's say, hey, um, Guillaume, I'm so... I'm so proud of what you did because look at what just happened this year. And of course, you you write this right uh, 12 months before. Mm -hmm. You can imagine uh, wh what should happen, and inevitably you're going to think about what's what you've done within the company, but what outside, who you work with, what challenges you've been able to face, how you've been able to ad to adapt. So um, so that in that requires writing for sure but not the kind of writing that necessarily needs to be published. It doesn't have to be perfect. It could be just bullet point notes on a journal, but ex externalizing those ideas so that you can be aware of them, you can contemplate them and make better decisions on how you should evolve. Right. And then there is also a mindset piece. You have to be uh, in, you have to be curious. You have to use your, everybody is curious, but that's when you need to be more curious than, than, than usual. And and go out and really take, you know, really observe what is happening around you. You know, what what is going on? What are, what are the inevitable trends that scare you, maybe, or that make you excited? Right. That, so so these are some some practical things you can do. Uh, it's not a it's not about writing a one document. It's not, we're not, I'm not talking about writing a book, for instance, or, or a blog post or, or a brand, you know, guide. Uh, although you may want to document in you know, something more, more formal, but I'm talking here about a process. I'm talking here about a practice. Building a strategic narrative is a practice, is a set of behaviors, of habits. It's a set of, uh, activities exercise that you kind of do on an ongoing basis if you will it, it's never done yeah as long as your company um you know will exist yeah. so if you if if you struggle you know with that know that it's never going to go away there will always be changes around us i mean look at us it's it's, it's constant right. evolution so from the get-go, I would, I would have this very, very clearly in mind. Yeah, that's it's really interesting because I think from a marketing perspective, I'm often thinking of what's the story that we need to market. I'm not as often thinking about what's the narrative that is currently unfolding. Um, it's it's much more fluid. There's mm -hmm. exactly yeah, there's yeah, so yeah. many conversations about controlling the narrative. Um mm. and you know, with reputable bro you you've worked with big brands and I think the bigger the brand, there's even more, you know, you have a PR department to control the narrative. Can a narrative be controlled? Is that something that can be controlled and, or should we, should we be? Okay. There are two questions here. Can it be controlled for sure? Yes. It depends on how big, how many people it touches and what's the timing. Mm -hmm. If you're launching, launching something new that gets rapid adoption, yeah, you you may say, hey, you know, this week we're we're controlling the narrative. Look, everybody seems to be bought right. in, but again, it's but again, it's it's so fluid that that may, maybe you actually don't control anything. <laughs> it's just a, yeah. What you control is are your are your your habits. Uh, you know, is what you believe, what where you put your heart. That's where that's what you can control. Um, you know, the impact, the effect. I'm not sure. Should it be controlled? Um, I think it should be shared more than anything. I think you should invite people to a narrative and let people decide if that's the that's that's something that they want. I was talking about pizza, you know, earlier in our conversation, and there is a pizza chain called Mod Pizza that started in Seattle in two thousand eight. Who needs another pizza chain in two thousand eight? You know, in the U.S. market, and yet another right. brand. But the way the founders thought about making pizza was was radically different 
So did they think about we're going to control the narrative? I don't think so. I think they 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 thought more about we want to make a dent in what a pizza place sounds and stands for. We want to provide better jobs. We want to provide more equity in our store. We want to provide more opportunities. That's what uh, Mod Pizza stands for. And so did they try to change the narrative around a pizza chain? Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Did they succeed? I think to some extent they did. You know, they've got now, uh, I think the, the exact number is around 500 store in the US. They're expanding in, internationally. They're becoming a public company. I mean, their track record in terms of societal impact is, is undeniable. Mm-hmm. Uh, did they change n- not just the narrative around pizza, but also how we how we work collaboratively, how we uh, integrate a diverse, how we think about diversity in our society? I think they 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 put a dent on that as well. Yeah. Did they? And again, you know, so did they try to control? I'm not sure. <laughs> we should ask their PR yeah. person. <laughs> Maybe if that was their right. intent, but from the outside, that's not how I look at it. Well, yeah, and that's that's a great yeah. example. Um, I've always, I've always said that like the, not always in the last seven years, I've grown to say, um, and think about it that like the, our culture shifting towards consumers wanting to hear stories, wanting businesses Mm -hmm. to tell more stories and wanting businesses to be more authentic. It's actually, it's a really good thing because that exposes everybody. So if me as the consumer, if I expect that you're going to share your stories from your past and that you're going to be transparent about your narrative that you're in now that exposes everybody. And so if you have a good narrative, you have a strong narrative, a positive narrative, then that's going to be really good for you. But there's a lot of companies out there that they don't have, they don't have a narrative worth sharing. Um, in a sense, like no, uh, they're, and- they're not great companies. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, there's less room now for companies that are their only motive is making money at all costs and they're not thinking about impact. There's less room for those narratives now that consumers are expecting you to share your story. And it's going to be hard for a lot of businesses, but I think it's a good thing. I agree with you. I think it's a good, it's a good evolution. So it's a good progression. What gets in the, in the way for me, Seth is, um, the, what people think about, put behind the word story <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be a meta comment here but the the, the you know the, the narrative about storytelling so i i teach a class at the university of washington uh in the entrepreneurship program I've, I've done this for many years now and i like to kick off this class with a question what is what is story for people so no one really knows i get you know i have 100 students for me i will get 100 100 definitions Something very personal, but one common denominator is that they all, most of them, a large majority of them, uh, will will say it's lying, it's making up something, it's hiding part of the truth to frame something that is in your best interest. So there is that connotation, and that's that's a danger right there. There there is that idea that it's hard to be authentic, uh, and so. So, so I think every business has the potential to either create, change a narrative, or or join one. You know, it's not because you, you don't have to. You have to don't have to come up with something unique. You could say, you know what, that other um, business is in, in the same niche as us. They're saying something that I resonate with. I want to work with them. I want to partner. I want to join that that idea, that movement. Right? It's okay to do that. And that's the first act of courage in, in towards authenticity. That's how you build it. That's how you build really true. That's how you make the use of true right. storytelling. And sometimes I'll say, I'm sorry to say this, but I think there is a, th- there's been a whole kind of phase uh, where we, you know, in the last 10, maybe 20 years, we've all kind of rediscovered storytelling in the, in the realm of business and we're all excited about it. That phase to me is kind of over, and I'll you'll hear me say some sometimes that storytelling business storytelling 1.0, which I refer to that phase, mm-hmm. is, is dead because it just doesn't work. If if you're if you're going to think about storytelling as the as the nice kind of 
Hollywood, you know, romance thing that makes your brand look better. It just does not work. And to your point, Seth, I agree with you. People want to work with brands that are authentic, that 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 defend value. So, so, so that that's where I would make the difference. If you're still in that mode, and you you and you don't have a narrative, don't fall into that trap. Building a narrative is is an act of leadership. It's not just an act of literature. It's an act of leadership. And the first thing is to have the courage to say the truth about what you're seeing around yourself. Like for me, I'll tell you what it was. I was a young consultant and I was, you know, staffed, you know, to work with company XYZ. And I just could not stand that I would have to meet with people who are completely discouraged, uninspired in the workplace. That was to me, that wasn't fair. They're trapped into jobs because they have to have a paycheck and they don't know what else to do. But for that reason, there is no motivation. There is no, uh, almost like it, sound, it may sound a little harsh, but there is no respect for the, um, the, for humanity, you know, in, in the workplace. So that was, that was the thing I was against. And that's, that's, that's the thing that I was very transparent and, and authentic with myself from the get go. You mentioned something that is so powerful. Um, and it's that, Hey, I, I forget the exact words you mentioned. So remind me, but something about like the, the power I'll of <laughs> narrative, the responsibility of narrative, like it's an act of leadership. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. I say that I say that most business leaders think that building a strategic narrative is an act of literature. In reality, it's an act yeah. of leadership. I love that. There, they and I laid out principles to explain why. Oh. Um, I just I just published a, published a, a a short guide that presents ten of those. Yeah, principles. that's great, and that might be that might be the answer. I was going to just ask, kind of, as we bring this to a close, what are some what are some things that leaders, what are some steps leaders can take today, uh, if they're wanting to really improve this conversation around narrative. They're wanting to be more strategic about the narrative they're representing and communicating and leading out throughout their company. They should Love get it. my book. Love it. No, it's all, and that's great. <laughs> that, Absolutely. That okay yeah, tell say us that? about your book. Uh, we'll link it in the show notes. All no, that. I mean, okay. My book is one, one of the many tools out there. Okay. Uh, that's what I yeah. meant by this comment. Um, le leaders should really investigate this topic type up what is a strategic narrative i'm not the only one talking about this topic but i talk i talk about it in a different way more more holistic way now if you if, if you go to my website metahelm.com or you can just type in strategicnarrative.com on, on google that that will lead you to my website um i published a, an ebook there is i don't ask for sign up i don't i don't uh, steal your email to just to then spam you you can have it without that there's no 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 strings attached and it's a fast read it's 13 minutes i actually read it for you on youtube if you don't have a lot of time and I tried to load it with, with as many uh, practical guidance as I could and, and thought provoking statements there so that you start your journey. That's my, that's my actual advice there, Seth. Start exploring what your company stand, stands for from the perspective of, of what you stand for as a leader. What are you ready to fight for, defend, and, and let go of? That's the start of the journey right it. there. Put your flag, put your flag in the ground, you know, know what you stand for. I, I think that's, <laughs> that's great. We will link to, um, to your book and to the different resources you mentioned here in the show notes. Where's the best place that people can get in touch with you if they want to continue this conversation and find out more about what it looks like to work with you, Guillaume. Strategicnarrative.com is my website. I also, um, if you really want to hear often about this topic, I publish a seven day, uh, seven days a week. I, I send you an email with some of my latest thinking, examples, case studies, whatever comes through my mind that night. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. This has been really fascinating, Guillaume. I love that you are digging deeper than just business storytelling and that you're really looking at what is the responsibility involved what is the what's the narrative that is unfolding and and how do we relate to that this is such an important conversation so guillaume thank you so much for sharing some of your experience and insight into this topic and thank you for uh giving me uh for sharing your microphone seth and 
getting on stage and spreading the word. Thanks for letting me do that. Anytime.